The U.S. Navy strikes Islamic State targets from an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean Sea. Police in South Africa clash with immigrants as xenophobic violence returns to the country. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. And now the command of the U.S. Africa Command, which, has oversee, which oversees U.S. military operations across the continent, tells VOA the only route to peace in Libya is to bring together rival governments. General Thomas Waldhausen made the remarks at the Munich Security Conference ahead of Operation Flintlock, a joint military exercise set to get underway in seven African host nations. Henry Ridgewell reports from Munich. Libya's political chaos remains entrenched. The internationally backed government of national accord controls only part of Tripoli. Rival power bases vie for the capital and other cities. In the east, General Khalifa Haftar of the Libyan National Army holds sway. Speaking to VOA Sunday during the Munich Security Conference, General Thomas Waldhauser, who leads the U.S. Africa Command, said the United States is pushing for a unity deal. There's no doubt about the fact that, uh, that Haftar and his influence, especially in the East, is something that has to be dealt with. And this is when we talk about a political solution that has to take place. This is where it all begins. Haftar's forces control most of Libya's oil fields. Russian state-owned oil giant Rosneft signed a preliminary agreement with Libya's national oil company Tuesday to invest billions of dollars. It is the latest move by Moscow to reassert ties with Libya and further evidence of its strong backing for Haftar. General Waldhauser acknowledged Russia would likely play a role in any solution. We, we welcome anyone's, the goal is to get those two together. The goal is to get those two to talk and the goal is to make some accommodation in that regard. The United States has conducted a sustained air campaign against Islamic State militants in Libya. The Africa Command is building partnerships in the Sahel region aimed at tackling terrorists, staging an annual joint exercise known as Operation Flintlock. Nigeria is a key regional partner and the United States is providing intelligence support in the country's fight against IS-affiliated terror group Boko Haram. Speaking in Munich, Nigerian Major General Babagana Monguno said the association of global terror groups means international cooperation is vital. The uprising in Libya and the eventual capitulation of the Gaddafi government resulted in a southward flow of arms and human beings. The most natural place in sub-Saharan Africa for this flow was Nigeria. Nigeria's army has been accused of abuses by human rights group Amnesty International in the fight against Boko Haram. Waldhauser said the US military takes such allegations seriously when working with partners. We understand the requirement for battlefield ethics. We make it part of our training and we try to continue to emphasize that in all that, in moreover in just in aspects, but in the legal system, in our discussions with key leaders as well. The three-week Operation Flintlock 2017 will bring together 2,000 service personnel from more than 20 African, European and North American nations. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, Munich, Germany. Well, it has been a turbulent day on Friday in the South African capital. Police in Pretoria fired tear gas, water cannons and rubber bullets to disperse rival marches by hundreds of protesters after mobs looted stores this week believed to belong to immigrants. Armed police had formed a barrier between rival crowds of citizens and non-nationals marching in Pretoria. But both sides began shouting at one another and brandishing rocks and sticks, prompting police to disperse the angry mobs. The demonstrations follows uh, looting this week of at least 20 small businesses believed to belong to Nigerian and Pakistani immigrants. Residents say they attacked the shops because they were dens of prostitution and drug dealing. Others say they had lost jobs to foreigners. Now, viewers Anita Powell visited some of the destroyed businesses in Pretoria and learned that the roots of this anger are deep and complex and the consequences of the violence affect more than just foreigners. 
Bigglesworth Chimango ran this successful African restaurant for six months. But now he is shutting it down, just days after his neighbor's shop in this Pretoria neighborhood was trashed by angry residents who accused foreigners of bringing in crime and taking away jobs. Residents say this shop was run by a Pakistani family. They fled after this week's attack, and Chimango, who is Zimbabwean, says he does not want to be next. That's why I decided, like, it's not safe anymore. As you can see, my neighbor just next door, they just looted everything from his shop. And uh, I mainly believe these are just like ordinary thugs. It's not like uh, every South African who wants these people out. But uh, there are people who are frustrated about having jobs and thinking that all the foreigners, they come here to take their jobs. The violence has also affected local business people. This South African-owned restaurant was also forced to close because of the chaos. They opened days later, but with no food to sell. On Monday, they came in, they told me to close the shop. I said, why? They said, uh, if we don't, we're going to break uh, uh, the entrance, those gates, and then everything. Even at the gate, the, if you can check, uh, the gate is, is, is broken. They break everything. They use my gate, they use my entrance to go to that Pakistan shop to break at the back. Xenophobic violence is not new to South Africa, which is a magnet for migrants from around Africa. Attacks in 2015 left at least seven people dead. Nor are the underlying causes new. Systemic inequality, high unemployment, and racism have plagued South Africa since the end of apartheid in 1994. Activists blame the government. It's just very interesting that since 1994, our unemployment levels have stayed at between 25 to now 30%. You can't blame foreign nationals for that unemployment level. It's chronic, systemic unemployment. What is our government doing to create, put in place policies that uh, allow for, for a decent jobs? Chimango said he had a solution. About half of his small restaurant staff were South Africans. Now they, like him, are gone. Anita Powell, VOA News, Pretoria. Well, in the U.S., uh, lawmakers back in their home districts during this week's uh, congressional races are hearing from angry constituents at local town hall meetings. Now, the White House is dismissing the protests as a misrepresentation of a larger population. VOA's Jasmine Oni has our report. At town hall meetings across the country, U.S. residents are sounding off. Barely one month into President Donald Trump's administration, members of his party have returned to their home districts to crowds of concerned and, at times, furious voters, pressing for explanations to the president's policies. I think, however... From the repeal of the Affordable Health Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, to the president's immigration policies, Republican lawmakers are getting an earful. Wednesday in Louisiana, a fiery audience booed and shouted down Senator Bill Cassidy for trying to defend the Trump administration. The White House is on the defense, questioning just how real the voter concern is. I think some people are clearly upset, but there is a bit of, of professional protester manufactured base in there. Um, but there obviously there are people that are upset. But I also think that when you look at some of these districts and some of these things, it is, it is, it is not a representation of a member's district or an incident. It is a loud group, small group of people disrupting something, in many cases, uh, for media attention. President Trump also dismissed the protest saying via Twitter, the so-called angry crowds in home districts of some Republicans are actually, in numerous cases, planned by liberal activists. Sad. That's not true, sir. Some Republicans are staying away from in-person town hall meetings, instead holding telephone conference calls in hopes of avoiding passionate crowds like this. Jason Samelny, VOA News. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. And also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up. U.S. Africa policy expert says there is a huge difference, uh, rather huge differences between the U.S. and China's engagement with Africa. Stay with us.
This is Bizbeat. Head to China and you'll find more movie theaters there than anywhere else in the world. A choice among 40,000 plus theaters nationwide means you'll likely get any seat you want. For now, supply is moving faster than demand, but movie sales in the country are rising quickly. Consider that in 2003, box office revenue was just $121 million. Today, it's about $10 billion. Ren Xiaoyu is a nine-year-old student. She says, I can't feel the reality when I watch movies on a computer because it feels like pictures are just pasted on the screen. A growing box office market means greater pressure to fill the seats, and competition is fierce. Sophia Shen works for Lumiere Cinema. She says the competition drives the cinemas to keep promoting the qualities of environment, audio, video output, and services. To stay afloat, unfilled theaters sell popcorn and sodas while renting out space for events. For BOA's Bisbee, I'm Philip Alexio. Well, according to the Washington-based Brookings Institution, China has emerged as Africa's largest trading partner, providing demand for the continent's energy and minerals. Now, China's increased trade, however, has generated considerable controversy both in Africa and the West. In part three of my conversation with J. Peter Pham, Vice President and Director, Africa Center at the Atlantic Council, I asked him why some are critical of China when its investments seem to be boosting growth in Africa. China is doing a lot of business, but is it business that's helping Africa? First point. Second point with that, uh, on terms of trade, yes, China does not have conditionalities on, on its relationship with African states. It will do business with whoever is in power uh, and seek to gain, even if that goes against the will of the majority of people uh, in, case, in cases of states that are relatively authoritarian or short term. Now, that may lead to short term gains for China, undeniable. But I would make the argument that in the long term, if you are going to do well, both by yourself and by your partner, one has to have rule of law, one has to have certain political stability, one has to have certain conditions. And so if you're interested in the long-term uh, long relationship, there has to be. Now, whether those should be stated as conditions, how one goes about that, I think that's more art than science. But then at the same time, it looks like the African leaders like this status quo as far as uh, engaging with China is concerned. They seem to be uh, looking east as they, you know, they say now. So if you were to have a legal framework, would that be to the disadvantage of China? Or do you feel like perhaps African leaders may be even unwilling to develop that kind of uh, legal well, network? As you know, Vincent, Africa has 54 states, uh, each very different. And you have leaders, some more visionary than others, some with a very short f uh, time frame in mind. So we have to disaggregate all that. But speaking more g generally, I think it's in America's long-term interest to think for the long term. Uh, just a little bit on the um, Millennium Challenge Corporation, the MCCs. Uh, what has been the total value of those and uh, as far as the countries that are benefiting from that, has it really added much to the development of the continent? I think the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation, which gives large grants of money, and we're talking fairly significant, the r recent compacts have been valued for anywhere between 400 to 700 million U.S. dollars over a several year time frame. They give countries the opportunity to design their own program to build significant infrastructure that otherwise wouldn't be assisted by conventional aids that will help them make the next jump up. Has it been a universal success? Wouldn't say so. There, uh, and I'm on the record raising questions about some of the combats. But as a, as a whole, I think it's well-intentioned. I think it's done a lot of good in countries that have used it well to build out major infrastructure. Uh, uh, and I think that's significant. One of the big programs that was started by President George uh, W. Bush was uh, PEPFA uh, to address HIV AIDS in Africa. And uh, recently in his uh, confirmation hearing, uh, Secretary of State nominee Rex Tillerson called PEPFA, in fact, one of the most extraordinary success, uh, successful programs in Africa. Uh, first, what is your thought on how it is currently performing 
And how about some of who have said this is like a big entitlement program for Africa? Well, two things. One, it's a certainly a success uh, on several. One, of human life. If one values human life, uh, one has to acknowledge the lives are saved. Some 8 million people are alive today in Africa because of PEPFAR. That's a success, and that's one that should be celebrated, acknowledged. On the other hand, PEPFAR was envisioned, if one goes back to the creation of the, uh, of what was the President's Emergency Fund, was to do something to help arrest the spread of HIV AIDS, but also to get African governments to take ownership of this and to carry it forward. And there, perhaps, we, there could be a little more. It's, it wasn't so that the U.S. would take the burden. It was to help with an emergency and then burden share for sustainability. So I'm not calling for a cut in the program. I'm not, I think it's been a tremendous success, not only in saving lives, but on the level of soft power dipl public diplomacy. It's been a great success for uh, a great brand for the American people and American foreign policy. But we also have to look at ways that we can make the program more effective and to get government buy-in. Because this shouldn't be, it sh this should be a help to Africa, not a, an opportunity for African governments to abdicate their responsibilities. Well, the director of the Library of Congress wants to upgrade its technology to make the electric mix of materials from books and photos to sheet music and baseball cards available to people around the world. Now, Carla Hayden became the new director of the world's largest library five months ago, becoming the first woman and the first African-American to hold the job as part of Black History Month in the United States. Now, viewers, Deborah Block tells us more about the professional librarian and our plans to improve the prestigious National Library in Washington, D.C. Well, a drugstore burned during Baltimore's riots of 2015. Carla Hayden decided to keep the library across the street open. The people did not touch the library, and they actually told us that they didn't touch it because it was the resource center in that community. It's beloved. It is protected. It is the place of hope in a community that needs hope. One year later, Hayden went from CEO of Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library to being selected by President Barack Obama as the director of the Library of Congress. Established more than 200 years ago as a reference source for members of Congress, the Library of Congress today is considered America's library containing more than 160 million items. There are also special exhibits like this jazz singer's display. You can go from actual physical items to things that you can download in prints and photographs. The public can view materials at the library but not check them out. Hayden wants to change that virtually using the latest technologies. We have things on our website that bring the collections to people wherever they are. They can download materials, they can participate, and we just had, and this is pretty exciting, a 3D virtual reality tour where you can put the goggles on and you can physically tour the buildings. Prior to her tenure in Baltimore, Hayden was the chief librarian for the Chicago Public Library. She appreciates the diverse neighborhoods she worked with. You want your libraries to have a standard of service but you need to also recognize the cultural heritage of the neighborhoods and the people who are in the neighborhoods. Hayden also wants to make Library of Congress materials available through traveling exhibits, especially beyond city limits. Reestablishing a mobile service, actually taking an 18-wheeler truck and loading it up with facsimiles. Uh, sometimes there'll be uh, electronic, uh, information and devices on those trucks and actually going into communities in rural areas. She wants to ensure that millions of items in the world's biggest library are accessible to everyone. Deborah Block, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Divisions among fans, critics and Hollywood insiders over which nominees should win the coveted Academy Award. We'll be right back.
you've just joined us, I'm Mariam Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In South Africa, police fire stun grenades, rubber bullets, and water cannon Friday at new anti-immigrant protests erupt in Pretoria. In the DRC, the army says it has successfully pushed back a rebel advance in the North Kivu region, close to the country's border with Uganda. In Mali, soldiers staged their first joint patrol with rival armed groups in the town of Gao. Finally, a Spanish NGO rescues a migrant boat carrying about 332 people trying to cross the Mediterranean before heading to Sicily. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. The 89th Academy Awards ceremony is on Sunday, and as usual, fans, critics, and Hollywood insiders are divided over which nominees will win the coveted award. Joining us live from the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles, where all the glitz and glamour is set to take place, is viewers Anastasia Tudishi. Anastasia, are you feeling the Oscar excitement over there? Hey, Vincent. Hey, everybody. As you can only imagine, the expectation is building here in Los Angeles, California. And let me just start by saying this. What a difference a year made. Just like the last year and the year before, not one actor or actress of color was nominated. The situation spawned the hashtag Oscar so wide and had actors, actors and actresses in the light of uh, Will and Jada uh, Smith to boycott the ceremony. Whereas this year, uh, the, it was a delighted Cheryl Boon Isaac, she's the president of the Academy, um, and she an announcing, we had her announcing with a bright smile that not less than seven actors and actresses of color were nominated in lead and supporting categories, including a report six black um, actors and actresses. And if we take a close look at the categories, um, Vincent, each of them recognizes a person of color, that means 19 person, persons, both behind and in front of the camera. Yeah. Now, Anastasi, uh, who are some of these nominees, if you can share with us? And we have a little delay there. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Uh, tell us more about these nominees that... Uh, the nominees, yeah. of course, this, let's start with the star of them all, Denzel Washington. Um, uh, he lands his seventh nomination this year in the prestigious Best Actor category with four fences. He has already won two, one for Glory and one for Training, training Day. Um, his co-star, Viola Davis, was nominated in supporting Best Supporting um, Actress, along with Octavia Spencer, nominated for Hidden Figures, and the British Naomi Harris for Moonlight. Third not for Viola Davis, she is the most nominated black actress. We also have in the lead actress category, Ruth Nigga. She's Irish of Ethiopian descent, and she was nominated for her work in Loving and in supporting actor, the amazing Marisala Ali, landed a nom for Moonlight. Also recognized in supporting actor is Dev Patel, a British actor of Indian descent for the film Lion. And now we know that uh, there has been controversy surrounding this Oscars this time. Can you tell us more? Well, I have to say, Vincent, you're well informed. Uh, the recent immigration ban by the President Trump raised strong reactions among actors. Everybody recalls Meryl Streep's compassionate speech. Uh, while receiving her Cecil B. the Mail uh, Award and the, pres the presidential tweet, basically calling her a nobody. 
But there's more, for instance. A talent um, agency called UCA made the headlines a few uh, the headlines a few days ago when announcing it will hold a pro-immigration rally in lieu of attending the governor's ball hosted this year by Mr. and Mrs. Trump. Now, uh, for some of those watching from Africa, they would like to know, are there nominees at all of African descent this year? Well, we can consider Ruth Liga. She, I, I told you about her. She, she is from, she's Irish of Ethiopian descent. Africa is present also, um, African is also present with, um, um, in, the, in the category of um, documentary feature. It's not an African film director, but the topic focuses on um, migrants from both Africa and, and Middle Eastern uh, countries. And the, the documentary is called um, uh, Fire at the Sea. Also, we have Raul Peck. Well, he's nominated also for his film. It's a documentary, uh, I Am Not Your Negro. Raul, Raul Peck is Haitian, but I decide that he's also Congolese. He, um, he made the very beautiful uh, film Lumumba dedicated to uh, Patrice Lumumba's uh, life. And very quickly on that, uh, the Lumumba story, very exciting. I mean, you come from, uh, originally come from the DRC, where Lumumba came from, right? Absolutely. Same country as Patrice Lumumba. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Anastasia. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again on Monday, hopefully. Enjoy the Oscars and enjoy Los Angeles. Thank you. Now that is uh, viewers Anastasia Tudish reporting live from Los Angeles. And that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 8 and UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us here. Have a great weekend. Welcome to English in a Minute. When something loses its original shape or form, it does not look very natural or comfortable. Bent out of shape. Hey, um, did you tell Greg about my dinner party? Yeah, I did. I thought he was invited. Well, now he's all bent out of shape because I didn't invite him. I'm sorry. Can you invite him now? It's too late. His feelings are already hurt. A person who is bent out of shape is upset or even angry about something. A person can get bent out of shape if they do not like the way someone is treating them. In our example, Greg is bent out of shape because Anna did not tell him about her dinner party. And that's English in a Minute.